we do think the way that we have implemented these kind of mechanics, and, and FIFA, of course, is our big one, our FIFA Ultimate Team and our PACs, is actually quite ethical and quite fun. Unethical. Today's Jimquisition, both personally and professionally, is an important one. You could almost say this one is the biggie. This is the result of me having spent a lot of time talking to Jimquisition viewers who have been kind enough to share their own stories. This is the result of me watching on in utter disbelief as the game industry proudly boasts and gloats about the ways in which it psychologically hooks people into unethical, unnecessary, aggressive video game monetization. This episode, more than any other, should indicate to you, should, should portray to you, should explain to you exactly why I am so committed to expressing my disgust towards the so-called triple A industry. This is a video on the internet. Please enjoy. Addiction is a disease defined by compulsive use of a substance or pattern of behaviour that one cannot stop, even as it has a severe negative consequence on a person's quality of life. The most famous form of addiction is of course uncontrollable drug use, as people all too easily can find themselves dependent on any number of chemical substances. Non-chemical addiction can be just as harmful, and because there is no exterior chemical component to point at as the villain, it's often misunderstood in a way that directly harms the addict. Sex addiction, for example, is often portrayed as people just being horny miscreants hiding behind an excuse for infidelity and similar indiscretions. Those with eating disorders are dismissed as greedy, while on the opposite end of the spectrum, compulsive exercising is often overlooked because, hey, exercise is good for you, right? Not if you're doing it so much that you're actually tearing your body apart. Meanwhile, those with gambling problems or shopping addictions are all too easily written off as idiots who can't handle their money correctly. Non-chemical addiction is no less destructive than drug addiction, and I can speak from experience with both. I was in constant chronic pain for over two years with a spinal hernia, for which the only genuine treatment I got for the most part was armfuls of painkillers, which after two years became a severe dependence. At the same time, I've had friends cope with chemical addiction and sex addiction, and among my many non-chemical vices is a workaholism issue that sees me pour a dangerous, unhealthy amount of my self-esteem and sense of identity to the quality and success of the work I put out there. And in many cases, such as mine, there are deeper psychological issues which addictive behaviour is used to cope with. My doctor, for example, cited hypermanic depression as a root cause for my abuse of drugs, a story all too common for too many people. Societal misunderstanding regarding addiction can compound the problem, but there are hundreds of thousands of businesses out there that do understand the power of addictive behaviour all too well, and use that understanding standing to make money. One such industry is the video game industry, which has seen revenue skyrocket by billions since the widespread use of gambling mechanics, raking in cash off the back of those who need help, not animated treasure chests help to get themselves to a better place. But it isn't just loot boxes, they're an offshoot of microtransactions and they themselves can be part of the problem. They themselves use psychological tricks, manipulation, to encourage compulsive spending, to appeal to compulsive shoppers. A huge amount of mobile games and microtransaction-led AAA games make the majority of their money from whales. The tiny percent of players who spend thousands of dollars on a single game. Who are these whales? Are they just rich kids with more money than cents? Sure, some of them will be, but not all of them. Maybe not even most of them. Just look up the stories of the people who get themselves into debt over FIFA games. Or the children who get their parents into debt over such titles. And some of these spenders, some of these whales, may indeed be addicts. They may be depressed people looking for a temporary high. Some of them may have had their addictions actively egged on by complete 
fucking scumbags like Tribe Flame CEO Tora Fjernström, whose gleefully malevolent lecture, Let's Go Whaling, is a proudly offered confession of exactly how low the game industry will sink to prey on both gambling and shopping addicts. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by w all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it uh, if we have time later. Oh yeah, shocked is the word. And when I watched this 19 minute celebration of exploitation, I understood exactly why morality was left out of it, because there is no fucking morality here. Jernstrom lays out exactly how addiction plays a role in so-called whale hunting, describing how the upsell of player convenience gets people forming habits around a video game. This technique is known as hook, habit, hobby, and I'll let Torolf explain it. Hook, habit, hobby. This is a, a uh, model from uh, Dimitri Dravano of Flare Games. Uh, it's a model for how people progress in a game. The hook is what gets you into the game to try out a, a free-to-play game. Then you build it into a habit that you play multiple sessions every day. And then at the end, it's the hobby phase where, where people uh, see it as their, one of their main hobbies and they put, put lots of time and resources into it. With the hook habit hobby scheme, we see an insidious method of monetizing compulsion. Like a cartoonish drug dealer from an 80s PSA video, the game introduces a good deal first with the aim of getting the customer habitually desirous of more. The concept of the icebreaker deal is downright sinister, and you'd think a casually dressed game dev explaining the concept like it's no big deal would lessen how ghoulish it sounds, but nope, oh my, nope. The hook is where you put up an icebreaker. You want to give a really, really good deal, something that's a, a no-brainer. You would be crazy to turn it down as a player. The reason to give a really good deal up front is by making people spend up front, they are also emotionally committing to your game, their retention will go up. And the first spend is, uh, it breaks the ice, then they think of themselves as spenders in the game. It's okay for me to spend in the game. Uh, lots of people are otherwise have this wall up, I will never pay for a mobile game. So you need to break the, the wall first. We'll get back to more from this person later on. Right now, let's look at a very different statement. A statement not from a whale hunter, but the brother of a so-called whale himself. A whale with a very genuine gambling problem whose love of video games helped him deal with that problem, only for said games to stab him in the back when money was to be made. When my brother came of working age, he found work as a chef, and is still one. It's early morning to late at night hard work, so on the weekends he got into gambling. Casinos, betting slips, horses, everything except online gambling. It got so bad my family had to actively manage his money and help him to stop burning his entire paycheck on this shit, as it meant he never saved money to move out. This eventually worked after months, and he started spending his free days playing video games, FIFA and Call of Duty. We always played COD together growing up, and we all agreed this was far healthier. Stupid me never took any notice of loot boxes, so I didn't click that this might be a problem. After another few months, he was always asking for money for this and that. Eventually, my parents had enough and found out that he needed the money because he was spending the majority of his salary and savings on loot boxes in FIFA, literally thousands of pounds. My parents now control his accounts and give him a weekly allowance. He's a grown man, for Christ's sake. He is not a rich person throwing money at a game to make it more affordable for us. He's a working class man who used loot boxes as a direct substitute to old world gambling. I was back for the summer to work for him to make some quick money, went back to play COD with him, and what do you know, it's COD World War II, and I noticed the fucking loot boxes. A little part of me sank when I saw that. Hope he finds a better way to deal with it. These are the whales, so callously hunted by assholes with lanyards. It's very easy to suggest that these are people who should just be smarter with the money, that only a fool lets it get this bad. I refuse to believe that anyone that churlish about the situation has ever dealt with addictive behaviour in their own lives. I simply refuse to believe it, because addiction simply does not work that way. You can't just switch it off. It's not that easy to simply stop. You can even know all day long that what you're doing is wrong and you can consider yourself stupid 
and you can know that it's harmful, but that won't stop you. It doesn't just stop on a dime, and the game industry knows this. That's why they go after those who will form habits. As we've already noted, addiction doesn't tend to form in a bubble. It more often than not is a symptom of and a response to other mental health issues, and it's not uncommon to find an addict with multiple chronic habits. In this next testimonial, we learn once again how easy it can be for the right victim to fall prey to the subtle machinations of video game gambling, as well as how those in recovery for addiction are playing a dangerous game when all they want to do is play an actual game. I spent a good portion of my life constantly high and wasting all of my money on drugs. I met my partner, now fiancé, in World of Warcraft, and with her help, I finally managed to get sober. One big part of going through rehab and trying to control my addictive behaviours, one of the things I learned was to try and find a healthy replacement for the substance. Obviously, being a chronically ill hermit and geek that I am, I turned my focus back to my childhood love of video games. This, ironically, was around the time of the beta of Overwatch, and me and my WoW guildies loved it. It was so much fun. I loved the idea of collecting cosmetics for my favourite characters as I am a big collector, and naturally fell into the trap of loot boxes. I kept getting sucked in with the spend more to get more trap that a lot of publishers use to get people spending. I lost track of the amount of money I spent, but thanks to rehab I could quickly identify that this was dangerous behaviour and I quit playing the game. I spent the next few years jumping from game to game, leaving when the microtransactions got too much to bear. Rift was a nice distraction from WoW, and I had played it from beta, and then it went free to play with loot boxes as well as a cash shop. Guild Wars 2, cash shop and loot boxes. Deus Ex, a series I treasure, microtransactions. Assassin's Creed Origins, same thing. The place where I once found distraction and salvation is now preying upon my addictive nature and impulse spending problems. It hurts. It really does. I have had to turn away from a hundred Australian dollar games because they've implemented microtransactions and the idea of popping in a few bucks to make life easier is so tempting and I keep falling for it. Again and again. My fiancé has now taken away both my debit card and my PayPal details to try and curb this. It's a weird mentality of, it's only here for a limited time, and if I don't get it now, I may never get it again, and not complete my collection. Hitting that buy now button, seeing the rewards pop up, the spinning of the dice or slot wheels ticking past the rare loot, the just one more rationale, it completely overrules any common sense like you need this money to pay rent or your medical bills or food. When game industry mouthpieces claim microtransactions and loot boxes are fine because nobody's forced to buy them, I think of those who have had to move from video game to video game, actively pursued by the microtransactions that threatened to drag them back down the hole. The industry loves to claim it's optional to justify microtransactions, willfully ignoring how video games are designed to be grindier and less convenient to make their time-saving in-game purchases way more appealing. None of us have the option to avoid deliberately bad game design in the video games we buy. And those with shopping addiction and gambling addiction have no option to even play these games without the risk of slipping back into destructive behaviour. Now I've shared my disgust with the video game industry here many times. Some understand my outrage, others not so much. It is my hope that with these testimonials juxtaposed against the sheer negligent insensitivity of men like Torolf Jernström will go some way to explain explaining why an addict like myself, who would more than likely be a victim of in-game gambling, were I not already so professionally against it, would be so utterly fucking 
furious at what the video game industry has encouraged in recent years. The industry not only knows what it's doing, it's celebrating it. It's doing it in public, at conferences and in calls, sharing the knowledge and the tactics that instill habitual spending among their audiences. There is a veritable treasure trove of evil fucking wisdom out there that doesn't attempt to hide how predatory this industry has become. None of this is a secret. None of this is obscure. This is out in the open. Hot state. There's an excellent uh, book about um, behavioral psychology called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. I'm telling you that the fast thinking mode is what you want. The slow thinking is, is your analytical brain. Uh, what's 12 times 47? I'm sure all of you can answer that, but you have to start your actual thinking brain to do that. Our brain works in these two modes, and starting the analytical part of your brain is too much to ask for a spend. Make stuff immediately useful, immediate gratification. If you have a, a level-based game and you sell some boosters up front, for instance a coin doubler or, or uh, some other stuff that will help you, People will have to analyze and think it through. These things are good for me, these will help me progress before they do it. If on the other hand you do like, for instance, in this uh, temple run, once your game is over, save me, I have a few seconds to spend hard currency and, and I get to continue. The IKEA effect, uh, this is to say stuff that we put work into, we value more highly. Uh, you know, IKEA really sells you cardboard stuff, it's shit, but you value it still somehow slightly higher because you actually built it yourself. There's a trigger to remind us to do something, then we go do an action, we get the variable reward, just like the gachas, we, we get uh, the lottery ticket, and then to really hook it down, we need to ask people to do something for us, do a little bit of work, because then they become emotionally attached to that. Anchoring is fun. Anchoring means that when we don't know the price of stuff, the first price we hear suggested for it becomes our anchor, and then we compare everything to that. Some games, immediately uh, when you're in, in the tutorial, they suggest to you, you should buy this good IAP for 50 euros or, or something like that. I, I go like, oh, that's expensive, I'll never do that. Of course, no, and I expect them to say no. Then again, I come back, back like, uh, a few se sessions later and suggest they buy it for, for 15. And I will say, that's a good value because my anchor was at 50. Get people to knee-jerk spend, to not think about what they're doing as they're doing it. Keep the pressure up with limited offers, fixed prices to make each spend more appealing. Get players a sense of emotional as well as financial investment. Maintain the sunk cost fallacy as long as possible. Everything I've ever ranted and raved about on the Jimquisition is not only supported, but gloated over by people in the industry. Right down to the bullshit excuses I've had to demolish before, such as spreading the nonsense that microtransactions are required in order to to support developers. In fact, Janstrom notes that you don't even have to be all that convincing in your lies. If we tell people they are a certain way, if we compliment them on, on being nice, good citizens, they are more likely to behave as nice, good citizens. So you should actually tell your players that they are uh, generous individuals who, who have a, a taste for good art and, and uh, want to support their, um, their game developers by paying you and buying IAPs. Related to that, also to te telling people the reason to do something makes them much more uh, likely to actually fo follow through and, and do that. Spend because reasons. The reasons don't, don't, don't even have to be that good in order for this to work. The total bollocks spouted on behalf of the game industry justifying aggressive microtransactions and gambling mechanics it is not only perpetuated by people within the industry but people without it as well and it's always dismaying to me to see games media games journalism um, you know structures that should hold the industry to account going to bat for them most recently and most disgustingly there was an article on polygon called anti loot box bill poses a real threat to sports video games with the tagline how else are these billion dollar licenses paid fuck you
These modes, if they don't directly pay for the games we enjoy, at least justify the workforces and development costs that make them worth playing. That oily microtransaction money, hard as it is to defend even in the abstract, helps those women and men deliver something that meets the unrelenting it's in the game standard we've taken for granted for a couple of decades. No, they don't. They were being delivered before microtransactions happened. You fool. And as we've already explained, the whole microtransaction support the developers line is bullshit. It's bullshit. The routine layoffs this industry has, often to celebrate things like record revenue intake, wholly demonstrates that people are losing their jobs all the time, regardless of how much money is flowing into the industry. The article essentially boils down to, won't somebody please think of the corporations, and relies on the age-old myth that video games are just too expensive for multi-billion dollar companies to make them anymore. In doing so, the article does hit upon a very real problem, but the understanding of the problem presented is completely fucked. Nobody publicises exactly how much their cash cows bring in, of course, but it's instructive that Take-Two agreed to a deal paying the NBA 1.1 billion over the next seven years. That's double the value of the last deal, which was inked in 2011, well before virtual currency was introduced to my career. I don't think Visual Concepts replaces that dough by reselling NBA's greatest DLC or the Sprite Slam dunk contest. Polygon's writer suggests that sports games would suffer under recent pushes to regulate loot boxes because the licenses for the sports in question are now costing billions, and it's frustrating because the writer is so close to the truth there, so close to the issue, but decides the best solution is to put gambling mechanics in these fucking video games rather than ask why a sports association is charging so much bloody money for the rights to make a game that said association directly benefits from. Let's not forget these licenses were perfectly affordable before loot boxes came along, it's only post loot box that suddenly they're far too expensive. I mean, imagine a hypothetical world where Electronic Arts suddenly couldn't afford the rights to make a FIFA game. As if FIFA would allow a year go by without a FIFA game existing. Get fucking real. If for some reason one of these publishers couldn't afford to make a FIFA game, and let's be honest, they'd find the money somehow, likely the price for the licenses would go down. All this fucking Polygon article does is argue in favour of the perpetuation of a problem in order to perpetuate another problem, suggesting gambling mechanics should stay in video games so that sports associations can keep charging through the asshole for their licenses. Fuck right off. This weak, weak article completely hand waves away any real issues, any real concerns people have with gambling mechanics as coming from people who just hate EA or were just angry about Star Wars Battlefront 2. Piss off. I knew this video I was working on was coming when that article went out and I had to bite my tongue at the time because I was saving it for now. Having had already spoken to gambling addicts, shopping addicts about this topic, to see concerns so sneeringly batted away in favour of complete corporate propaganda thoroughly disgusted me and continues to disgust me. Games Press should be holding these companies to account, but they can't even comprehend why loot boxes and microtransactions overall are so fucking poisonous. Because they don't think about the prey, they don't think about the people these companies are preying on, they only see them as whales, dehumanised whales. And that misunderstanding has to stop. They're not rich kids with enough money to spare, they're not goddamn sea mammals, they're people with vulnerabilities that this game industry is exploiting knowingly, gladly, greedily. And I am overhearing any defence for them because they are unbloody tenable. The regulation of loot boxes might not be pleasant, and it's not something I explicitly gunned for, but I did warn the game industry that it was coming, that if they kept pushing these microtransactions, if they kept pushing the limits to see exactly how much they could get away with, they would end up with a fight on their hands once politicians got interested. I said this time and time again, and no one bloody listened, and now look where we are, and it's on the industry's head. It's on their head, nobody else's, it's their problem, they do not deserve people taking up arms and defending them because they merrily walked into this situation. And ultimately, if you need gambling mechanics to keep your fucking games going, 
You shouldn't be in business. The world can do without your exploitative crap. Not that you really need them, you didn't need them before, you'd find a way to work around it if they were to go away. It's always about greed, it's not about need. And if you trip over yourself to apologise for what these corporations do, you are little more to them than a useful idiot. To have any chance of turning players into payers, game developers need to get their in-app purchases right. Office and scarcity uh, plays into the loss aversion if there are um, rare cards up here and you see, see the goblin going with his clocks tick tock. I'll take it away from you, I'll take it away from you. Uh, they, they are scarce, they go away. This is a brilliant way to, to uh, get more. Monetize, retain, acquire. This is the mantra of the modern video game industry. It's been the creed of the shit-sucking mobile sector for years and years, and in recent times, from the tail end of the last generation to now, it's increasingly become the creed of the so-called triple A game publisher. Monetize, retain, acquire. Form those habits, trick those customers, turn those players into payers, as one disgusting organisation once suggested. Much of what they are doing is unethical, much of it is certainly immoral, so much so that little talk givers need to check their morals at the door to even discuss the tactics at play. And the industry gets away with it because such addiction is so often misunderstood. Another testimonial I received, one of many more than discussed in this video, described how they got hooked on a MOBA that used social pressure to keep people spending and how nobody would help them when they sought support to stop. Uni's response, it's not gambling, it's not an addiction, they said. They offered me zero support because the counsellors simply couldn't get their heads around that I was addicted to wasting money just for friends on a video game. There was nothing. No support. Just another round of adults who drowned my voice out and I was berated for not having a real problem and just being a spoilt child. Peer pressure is just another way the industry makes money off the back of vulnerable people. Recently news broke that kids are being bullied for only having default skins in Fortnite. While the game is free, children are pressured to keep up with their friends to maintain a social status by not being the poor scrub with the bargain basement cosmetics. Young Youngsters are reportedly begging their parents for Fortnite money because nobody will play with them otherwise, and the word default itself has become a derogatory term in schools. And if you think that's just kids being kids, that the game industry cannot possibly be held to account for this, <laughs> well, guess what else Mr. Yernstrom said? We are herd animals, we tend to do what all, all of the others do. Uh, you all sit quiet listening to me because that's what all, all of the other guys do, do here. So. Uh, especially when people are similar to, our, to us. This means that uh, you should have uh, the socially accepted way of behaving in your game should be paying. You want to tell pe people, for instance, their c when a clan member of theirs spend IAP money, you want the whole clan to know, because then that becomes the socially acceptable way of behaving. Uh, you by absolutely do not want to tell them that the majority of people in your game never spend money. That's poison. Never tell them that. Am I demonstrating this fucking clearly enough now? Am I effectively showcasing that this industry has nasty parasitic bastards in it that know exactly what they're doing and not only don't care, but are proud of themselves. And it's not just Jernstrom. You'll find men like him absolutely everywhere if you know which stones to turn over. David Zentel is a researcher and lecturer who has devoted much of his time to the study of loot boxes. In a paper published in June of 2019, he noted that while he cannot claim loot boxes create problem gamblers, there's evidence to suggest problem gamblers are certainly exploited by them. According to his findings, when loot boxes were removed from Heroes of the Storm, problem gamblers, and only problem gamblers, spent less money on the game. The spending habits of other players didn't change. The spending habits of the gamblers did because the gambling was gone. There are many studies showing a correlation between gambling addiction and loot boxes, but correlation is not causation, I will say that. However, 
the near identical psychological similarities between loot boxes and gambling, coupled with reports like those from Zendel, support the idea that those with addiction struggles are routinely preyed upon by an industry that, regardless of whether they create compulsive gamblers, sure as shit profit from them. And as Electronic Arts' legal VP sits before a parliamentary committee trying to rebrand loot boxes as surprise mechanics and claiming they're ethical because people enjoy them, I need to stress just how dirty the game industry's money is. And it's not just dirty, it's filthy fucking money. The billions upon billions being funneled into the offshore tax havens of these video game companies stink of abuse. Shameless profiteering abuse. If it's not outright evil, it is amoral in the extreme, and they flaunt their immorality in public with the smug, satisfied self-confidence of monsters who've gotten away with it. Just go back and watch, again, the sneering manner in which EA's Kerry Hopkins patronises her way through an explanation of what loot boxes are. Just go and read the articles from dozens of industry mouthpieces who disregard criticisms of microtransactions because if people didn't want them, they wouldn't spend money on them. That argument, in the face of the compulsive strings microtransactions pull, is as weak as it is despicably dishonest. There was a comment on Reddit once that said, Jim Sterling is not pro-consumer, he's anti-triple-A. And I'll take that, that sounds fine by me. I do hate what the mainstream industry has done to the medium. How the unchecked, unimpeded greed that fuels corporate decision making has turned games into grindy, unsatisfying money vacuums, all in the name of psychological ambush. I say this not with affected internet outrage, but with a genuine, understated, ice-cold fury. I genuinely hate most video game publishers, their executives, and every seedy, slimy, corrupt thing they've done to both the industry at large and, more importantly, their many victims. You damn right, I'm anti-triple-A. Hopefully this video has gone some way toward explaining uh, the level of anger I have when it comes to talking about mainstream triple-A video games. It should explain why. Uh, whenever I say triple-A, I struggle not to do it in a sneering, condescending, mocking voice because, I mean, I've always found that the, the designation triple-A is arrogant on the, on the part of the game industry. It's, it's a sign of arrogance, just showcasing that they think they're so far above everything else when nothing they do actually uh, qualifies them for a designation of three A's. A is supposed to be good in grading, and the triple A video game industry is not triple A, it is triple shit. Ah, that showed them their triple shit. Anyway, I, I, I hope that this video indicates to you that I don't do this for, as some people call it, outrage clicks. I do this because I fucking care because I give a shit, because I truly believe in my heart that this is an important topic. That I do hold uh, the values that I, that I express when I talk about uh, microtransactions and loot boxes and whatnot. You know, I hold those values true to myself. I, I, I really do believe that when I talk about this, I am right. I wouldn't say it if I didn't think I was right, if I didn't know I was right. I truly am not optimistic about where the so-called AAA video game industry is going. Comprehensive, complete feeling productions are becoming rarer and rarer. Shallow, threadbare, unfinished games that are designed deliberately poorly so that you can pay extra to improve the experience. They're becoming the norm. The idea of the service video game is a lie because it isn't a service. Well, it's not a service they provide to you. It's a service you provide to them. You are giving them, you are inviting them direct access to your wallet. They sit back and collect money off you simply for existing. And they spout lies, lies and propaganda that are then perpetuated by their defenders, by certain journalists, by spokespeople in the industry. And it's a racket and it's shameless, and it's disgusting. Thank you so much to the people who did share their stories. Thank you so much to people who showed me 
um, some of these open boasts from the video game industry itself. Thank you to Casey Explosion, to H Bomber Guy for reading uh, the testimonials we had. Thank you for watching, and of course, of course, thank God for me.